Here you go. And you're from uh, MSU, and you're going to talk about when the conservation education staff inspires and use too. You have seven minutes now. Or Hi, everybody. I'm glad to begin this presentation session, and I'm pleased to present you the renovation project of Amiens Zoo. Until 2024, the zoo will be completely renovated from a conservation education program built by the zoo team. It work? Yes. 130 kilometers from Paris in France, I'm sure you will have recognized my accent, the city where Jules Verne wrote all his books opened the zoo in 1952. Ed education is in the heart of the zoo since the creation of the educational and cultural unit in 1982. So education is uh, quite about uh, a lot of things in the zoo. The zoo is built on an old botanical gardens and many canals run through it. This is why the renovation project used this landscape specificities to serve a strong conservation education message about the importance of, um, of wetlands in the world and the value of their conservation. Rather than artificially creating some territories to present some species, this huge wetland will be divided into different um, ecosystems, wet of the five continents. There are finally eight territories of visits, which will be presented in the park with, with uh, each one its collection onto a precise ecosystem and a message dedicated to the environment which is represented there. The first six zones invite the visitor to explore the world through the discovery of wetlands in the world, ecosystems rich in biodiversity but extremely vulnerable. Archipelagos, just before, questions on island and, and continental ecosystem of Southeast Asia. Tropics plays on the scales and immerses into the heart of the tropical forest of West Africa. Equator explores, um, and, uh, explores the richness of the rainforest. This one hectare territory will be populated by 20 species. Marigots flies over South America's floodplain savannas uh, with an immersive aviary and a vivarium. Rivers reveal the banks of an European watercourse. Um, it's good to know that the zoo is a shelter for local biodiversity, and here we want to, uh, to sensibilize our visitor to its protections. And Shores uh, discovers the, 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 the coast of the Americas, the Pacific coast of the Americas. Two other territories offer a different perspective uh, to the visitor uh, on the trail with the clearing. The clearing um, reveals the uh, complex relationships between the human and animals and savannas exposed to the aridity of sub-Saharan landscapes. This eight territory will be um, populated by species selected for the importance of their conservation, like Dokkas gazette, Chinese alligator, or adax, and to serve the message. For example, we will find the meerkats next to scorpions to talk about trophic relationships and learning. And all education aspects has been completely redesigned to be varied and inter interactive. First, there will be with species information panel to give species information with drawing rather than pictures, short text for attractiveness and effectiveness and various icons. Next, the object listen will talk about broader notions on species groups or concepts such as evolutionary convergence, mimicry, camouflage, or environmental adaptations. And these two types of panels will often be associated with explanatory, with sensory elements, um, like cast of skins, skins skulls, bones, um, smells, or sounds to a better understanding. Finally, educational kiosk 
will uh, uh, address even more broader notions on species groups, on, uh, on concept or concept on environment and ecosystems. They will carry information about uh, an unobservable subject in the park and related to the envir environmental news relati relating to the dedicated geographical areas on the trail. The link between all of these notions is also cultural and related to people's beliefs. So cultural elements will be mm, will allow the public to open up to of the um, symbol and beliefs incarnated by animals in the world, which is another path of awareness of the necessary conservation of the biodiversity. If you come to Amiens one day, why not? You will see that the city is proud of its history, and we want to yes, and we want to to to, to save and the zoo want to preserve some some elements of its past, which will be um, associated with explanatory panels, like in the right, or some elements will be totally renovated, like the blue pavilion, which is our future restaurant. So you you come. Uh, you, you can come and, 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 good, uh, and have good food. <laughs> and the small bonus in front of some enclosure have the, are the behind the scene panels. Here, subject like recognition of individuals and, um, and veterinary inform information can be provided. Conservation education will be present also through facilities. In this big entrance building, uh, we will find an educational hub with two classrooms for, for students from kinder kindergarten to university. And the zoo want to provide some views and access on some building. And in right, just, I don't know how, just, just here, it will be a view on the kitchen when visit where visitor we can see keepers cooking for animals. And uh, the small bonus of this building is just above the classroom, just here, a special place that we call the hanging, the hanging garden, which is um, a place designed to special occasion like, like, uh, like cocktail or particular event. We want this place to be a magic place in the zoo. It's good to know that during the renovation work, the zoo remains open and we, and we want to link today's zoo and tomorrow's zoo. Visitors, we know that visitors like pa participating to the renovation or news in the zoo, so we organize frequently workshops for them, like educational hive painting or manufacture of insect hotel. Last year, we created the small curiosity. This is the picture on the right. And we'll, we, we will talk about uh, this year about um, how zoo staff design new enclosure. Finally, annual programming is related to the project and, uh, and to the social culture. We make Halloween, Easter eggs, and we, we at, at each event, we want to um, sensibilize, sensibilize, sensibilize our visitors to the conservation uh, on bi biodiversity. I'm finished. <laughs> and so, <laughs> at the time I'm talking to you, the work for the first two zones have begun, and I invite all of you to see the, the, the work next year at the Anya Zoo. Thank you for your attention. I hope you understood everything. Thank you very much. Uh, and I don't think we have time for questions right now, maybe later. <laughs> Laura, your turn. Well, you can explain what you're gonna talk about. Yes, I certainly can. Uh, Perfect. So, <laughs> uh, I'm here to talk to you about involving zookeepers in conservation education using the EBSQUIF. This probably is raising a few questions. Why do I want to talk to you about zookeepers? Uh, what is an EBSQUIF? Why is there a photo of a manatee? Uh, 
hopefully I'll address all of those apart from the manatee. You'll have to ask me about that later. So for those at the back, it says zookeepers, I'm an educator. Uh, maybe that's not true. Uh, I'd like to ask, is there anybody in the room who actually would think of themselves as a zookeeper? Hands up. Okay. A few hands going up. We've got some zookeepers in the room, so we're not all educators. Uh, and then I'd like to ask how many of you in your institutions are actually uh, having zookeepers delivering conservation education? Are they doing demonstrations, talks? Are they helping with events? More hands going up. Uh, and keep your hands up. How many of you are working with zookeepers uh, to get information to help you design your activities? Almost all hands going up, lots of hands going up. So actually, zookeepers are quite relevant for conservation education. First of all, yeah, Epps what? Uh, what on earth is this thing that I'm talking about? Some of you who know me well will know quite a bit about the project, but for those who don't, this is something that's been occupying a lot of my time for the last three years, as well as a few other people in the room. And the intention of this project uh, is to improve recognition of zookeeping as a profession and uh, make it easier for zookeepers to move around if they want to switch jobs. Uh, as we know, in some parts of Europe, zookeeper training is really well developed. It's fantastic. Uh, in some other parts of Europe, there isn't really anything formal at all. So this is an attempt to kind of uh, bridge that gap and standardise things. How have we done that? The first part was actually developing a framework. So this is an enormous long list of all what we think are all the key skills, knowledge and competence that you need to be a good zookeeper. And the second part was to develop some training modules based on the framework uh, that would be an example of how you can actually use it to deliver training. And it's not just me that's done this, there's been a huge team. Uh, so these are the, all the partners, a few of them are here in the room, I won't ask them to raise their hands. Uh, so we were working with four ERs zoos, two uh, training providers, vocational education training providers, one in the UK, Sparsholt, and one in the Netherlands, Theodis. And then we had uh, two zoo associations, so that was EASA and the Romanian Zoo Association. I still want to know about education. Yes, I'm sure you do. So how does this relate to conservation education? Well, I think we've already established that zookeepers are involved in education. So what we wondered is, is this actually valued as a zookeeper skill? And this is a survey that was done uh, based on job adverts. So this is from 2015 and repeated in 2018. And what you see is that most of these job adverts they want their zookeepers to have good communication skills, but not that many of them are actually looking for zookeepers with specific education skills. And uh, a bit embarrassing, that smallest green there, that's actually within the IASA region. Only about 12% of those job adverts mention education as a skill they want their zookeepers to bring. And the second part was, are zookeepers actually getting the right training to do education? This is not education specific. This was not the question I wanted to ask when I collected the data, so it's not perfect. Um, but what this shows is that actually most zookeepers are getting a lot of their training from on-the-job training, so just following experienced members of staff, and comparatively few are getting actually formal training either in-house or externally. This might be great. They might be working with a really experienced person, but not necessarily. We don't know that for sure, so they may not be getting great training on how to actually deliver education. So how does EPSCREF help with that? First of all, we have quite a detailed section in the framework dealing with conservation education. I won't expect you to read all that. Basically, we identified three key competences and uh, they sort of uh, listed their expectations of how we would expect zookeepers to be performing if they're competent, if they're proficient or expert. And because we thought that conservation education was important and also that it was an area that wasn't necessarily addressed either in uh, on-the-job training or in zookeeper qualifications, we actually decided to choose this as a topic for our modules. And because we're overachievers, we didn't just make one conservation education module, we made three. So we have one on why is conservation education important, one about how do you actually do it, the methods, 
And the third one is a bit more keeper specific. How do you deliver good zookeeper talks? And these are all available for free on our website, which is zookeepers.eu. I do encourage you to take a look. Uh, and this is something that potentially you might want to talk about with your keepers, recommend it to them. And also, information might not be new for a lot of people in the room, but if you also bring in a lot of seasonal staff, these might also be useful for you as a quick way of helping to get your staff, uh, new staff involved in what conservation education is, how you do it. And the last thing I want to uh, mention to you is that we need you. Because uh, this is a project that's designed to help the whole of Europe, uh, the framework is available in a few different languages. The modules are just available in English right now. And uh, EASA is very keen to see these translated into more languages. So if you are interested, especially as conservation education specialists, in translating some of these modules into your own European language or non-European language, uh, please do come and talk to me. And I'd be happy to link up with you and see what we can do about that. If you have any questions, save them for the end or get in touch. I think that's probably completely invisible at the back. Uh, so if you look for our website, zookeepers.eu, you can find us on Facebook, uh, Zookeepers EU. So look for us there. And finish off with some thank yous. Uh, all the project partners, so that's several key contact people from each organisation and various other members of staff. Huge number of other people who've given input and support over three years. And finally, thank you very much to Erasmus Plus, who gave us the money to do it. Thank you very much, Laura. That's very interesting. We, we work a lot with zookeepers here in Skansen, and all of them are involved in uh, education. And uh, now it's time for Maria from Leningrad Zoo. And you're going to talk about eff uh, effectiveness of various methods of presenting information for school children age 12 to 17. Right. Okay, <laughs> good. Uh, hello, everybody. And firstly, sorry for my English. <laughs> So, I'm going to talk about the effectiveness of various methods of presenting information for school children aged from 12 to 17. There is a club of young zoologists at Leningradsky Zoo where school children aged from 12 to 17 study. For four years, they learn such disciplines as zoology of vertebrate animals, ethology, zookeeping and nature conservation. We strive to alternate different forms of uh, presenting information, trying to motivate children for active participants in learning process and trying to break the monotony of lectures. In this study, uh, we compared the effectiveness of uh, the most frequent uh, teaching methods. We considered effectiveness as the amount of knowledge learned by children. The main methods are just lectures with teachers' talk and um, presentation, excursions around the zoo, one day field trips where school children learn about uh, different plants, birds, animal tracks, and so on. Lectures with samples demonstration, for example, birds, nests, feathers, uh, animals, uh, skulls and skeletons, uh, mushrooms, and so on. And also box, uh, workbooks filling. Lectures with real animal demonstration that children can touch and view. Quests at the zoo. Children get tasks which they can complete examining the collection of the zoo by themselves. Quests at Zoological Museum. The same thing, children get tasks which they can complete examining the collection of the museum by themselves. Workshops with field guidebooks and uh, biological samples. Uh, they uh, get uh, some objects, for example, nests, skulls, mushrooms, which children can identify using uh, field guides. 
and the last one is identification of objects using binoculars. There are some uh, images of birds placed on some distance from children, so they can see them using binoculars. Children receive uh, all complete information, for example, write names of nests, birds, animals, on the end of every practical lesson. A few days after the lesson, from three to seven, uh, children have to answer 20 questions on the studied material. Uh, the amount of test young zoologists is shown on the slide. We tried to unify all testing forms. There was also a question air for school children uh, where they could give their opinion about different types of lessons. Uh, they scored criteria criteria from one to five. For example, uh, the excursion uh, around the zoo. Is it very boring, less boring, or very funny? Not memorable at all, very memorable, and so on. We compared results of testing after various uh, types of lessons, and it turned out that the most successful way of presenting information was one day field trip to nature. Uh, the second place is work with guidebooks and uh, identifying objects. And the third place is lectures with sample demonstration and workbooks filling. The least effective method was quests at the zoo, unfortunately. The effectiveness of these methods might be explained by simultaneous use of different sensory systems uh, during the learning process. Children touch, view, smell, observe closely, discuss and record the results. It was also interesting to reveal if all the types of presenting information that we proposed really worked. To verify this, we uh, compared uh, the results of children who attended lessons with those who were absent for any reason. The uh, effectiveness for children attending lessons was significantly higher than for children who uh, were absent. But excursions and quests at the zoo were exceptions. <laughs> some tasks children have to uh, do in a team, some individually. It turned out that individual work was significantly more effective than when children acted in teams. There was also a question air for children to get their opinion about different types. The variation of criteria that we used in the analysis is shown on the slide. According to the results of this analysis, several categories of lessons can be clearly distinguished. The first category includes quests, excursions, animals demonstration, and field trips. They are the most interesting, the most memorable, and very funny from children's point of view. The second category are lectures, just lectures, and lectures with samples demonstration. More or less interesting, more or less funny, more or less memorable. And the last category is visiting the museum, work with field guides, and identification of birds' images with binoculars. It's very uh, difficult to understand, not memorable, not funny at all from children's point of view. So, uh, we have uh, this situation. The most interesting lessons for children are the least effective ones with one exception for field trips. Then there is a question. Do we have to decline all not interesting uh, and um, but effective forms of presenting information? Well, it seems that for a better educational process, we need to look for some more informative options for lessons that uh, children like but they are not effective. And it is essential to add attractiveness to
to those types of lessons that are not interesting but very effective. Maybe we need to add some plain or competitive part. And field trips should remain as a regular part of the program as the main attractive and effective forms of presenting information. Thank you for your attention. Thank you. Charlotte from Chester 2, welcome up. There you go. Gosh, <laughs> right. Hello, so my name is Charlotte. I'm Head of Discovery and Learning at Chester Zoo. And I'm going to talk about the role of educators in species management planning based mostly on my work as the Education Working Group Lead for the Global Species Management Plans for Anoa, Banteng, Barbarisa and Sumatran Tiger. Um, we finally set this up rather well this morning talking about the Species Survival Commission and the species programmes of the IUCN. And I think when you look at their vision and goals, what you find is it's about people taking positive action for conservation. Conservation is about people. And that's why I feel the role of educators at the heart of that is really important. We're the people who work with people to encourage them to take that positive action. And the Global Species Management Plans, of which there are nine globally, are approved by WASA and are a collaboration between the conservation breeding programs of the different zoo associations, the species specialist groups, all working together on a global plan very much using that one plan approach. And we all have our own for each of the working groups. This structure shows how our GSMPs are structured with different working groups of the different specialists, but all working together for one goal, for stable and secure populations. The Sumatran Tiger Group is slightly in blue as they're a much more long-standing GSMP and have been working independently but we'd started to work together last year, whereas the other Action Indonesia GSMPs have only been going about three or four years. So this is our education working group. We met together as a group for the first time last February, and we have representation from America, Europe, and Indonesia from collections from those different um, zoo associations and also from the Indonesian Zoo Association themselves. And this is a group we're hoping to start growing as well. So the, the master plan for the GS GSMPs has very specific education goals within it, which cut across to the goals of the other parts of the plan. So we want to increase the capacity of not actually just zoo educators, but all educators, um, to deliver better quality and more conservation education about the species. We're really aware that our small cattle and our pigs are not the most popular species in zoos. Our collection planning colleagues sometimes find it difficult to persuade zoos to give them space. So we want to show how you can work with these species to engage the public and how that's a really important thing to do. And that's part of why we raise awareness and support for the conservation of Banteng, Anoa, Babarus and Sumatran Tiger amongst zoo visitors. And that support could come in many forms. It could be financial support, it could be giving space in the collections. It could also be about working in situ to change behaviours where people are living alongside those species. And we do that through having unified messages, providing resources and a campaign day. And we're also working with our colleagues in the in situ groups to create more work so that education is embedded into the in situ work of the GSMP as well. So to give some examples, we've been providing training. So we've done two big training sessions for educators in the last couple of years. We've also started a WhatsApp group for Indonesian zoo educators. They don't at the moment have conferences like this one to share practice. So really trying to improve conservation education by working with the zoo association as a group to improve practice but also providing resource packages and how-to guides and examples of what you can do for any educator who wants to do more around these species, particularly 
if they're species they don't know well or species they haven't worked with before. So these are just some of the examples that are on our website to download. Increasing awareness and support. That's coming to conferences like this one, talking to educators. We'll be going later this year to talk to Indonesian zoo directors to talk about the importance of education in their work and how they can influence conservation outcomes. But again, it's also about that unified messaging and resources and activities and providing a range of things for people to download to make it really easy. And then on the 18th of August, this is something I hope that Many of you, if you have these species, will join us. We're hosting our first campaign day on the 18th of August. Um, we want people to be sharing resources on social media, taking part in activities focusing on the crisis that is happening in Indonesia with those species and what we can all do to help. So I believe that zoo educators play a really important role in species management planning. We can help raise awareness of the species, increase support, highlight the actions that people can take and contribute the skills that we have as educators to the more holistic conservation action plans for those species. And some of those skills are our skills that are very much about education, but also we have skills in evaluation, in monitoring, in evaluating the success of plans or using logic models and theories of change. And that's something we've been able to support the GSMP and work with colleagues on. So if you'd like to get involved with the work we're doing, we'd love you to take part in Action Indonesia Day. We'd love you to, we are looking for more IASA members who have those species to join the working group. So if that's something you're interested in, please do come and talk to me. Or if you've got resources or training that you can share. And these are our contact details. So it's my email there. And also the website, which is very new. Oh. I thought that would stop, but I have finished. <laughs> but I have finished, so thank you very much. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Charlotte. Whoa. Well, it's time for Anya. Welcome up. And you're going to talk about the role of the educator in the zoo. Zoo's functioning process. Hello, everyone. I'm Anna from Wrocław Zoo in Poland. And I want to talk uh, about some new projects, new exhibits, uh, which I, I was involved in during the designing process. First of all, <laughs> I have to uh, say something about money, because most of this project uh, got money from uh, external financial institutions across uh, Poland and Europe. First of all, it was European Regional Development Fund and then European Economic Area, mostly known in Poland as uh, Iceland, Liechtenstein and Norway grants. Then uh, two uh, Polish uh, institutions, such as uh, National Fund for Environmental Protection and Water Management, and then the same institution, but uh, in uh, Wrocław Regional, Fund for Environmental Protection and Water Management. So, Odrarium. Odrarium is a very small exhibit uh, where inspiration was uh, Odra River. It was uh, the second biggest river in Poland. Uh, but we know that our visitors, uh, they don't know nothing about local biodiversity. So the Odrarium shows local biodiversity, especially plants and uh, fishes, no, but not only, also birds and one species of uh, local turtles. Uh, very common, very, uh, you can find it during the Odra River, but uh, they don't know about nothing about this. S but the most important thing is totally new habitat for otter. It will be open, I hope, next month, probably. Uh, now it's uh, under construction still. And we also have two other female and male in all uh, part of our zoo. Uh, but you can see it, <laughs> see those animals, because uh, old exhibits, it's very dark, uh, very tiny. That's why we decided to build another one, new one, biggest one. I saw the nice exhibit two years ago in Paris, and I wanted the same in our zoo in Poland, in Wrocław. 
Uh, so I design uh, most, uh, with of, of, of course, with cooperation with architects and our management, uh, the uh, educational facilities and edu educational uh, settings uh, across uh, the new exhibit. Uh, we were still waiting for spring in Poland, <laughs> well, like here in, s <laughs> in Sweden. <laughs> That's why there are not so many plans, but I hope in one month there will be a lot of them. Okay, another uh, new exhibit, uh, Wolf's Sanctuary. Uh, we got money from General Fund for Environmental Protection and Water Management. The inspiration was uh, an old mine. Uh, you can go under the ground, then you can see in the end the whole exhibit. And of course, Wolf's. It's also a continuation of uh, local part of exhibits in our zoo when we uh, show lynx uh, and brown bears, for example. Uh, you can see the sculpture uh, showing the behavior of pack of wolves. Uh, we also uh, try to engage local artists uh, as well uh, to prepare some educational settings uh, in our new exhibits. Another part, you can go uh, on the first floor, you can observe the walls uh, not only from the zero level, but first, and of course, the underground. It's also, um, there are much of work to do, we're still waiting uh, for the scalps over here, for example, the box is empty, but I hope it will, uh, we will get it soon from states because we don't have such a skulls, and just skulls <laughs> in Poland. Uh, this is the window you can observe from uh, minus one level the exhibit and uh, our walks. Okay, the uh, also new exhibit is uh, Leopard Territory, which was open last uh, summer in all this part, uh, other part in our zoo. And uh, we got money from European Regional Development Fund. The inspiration was uh, two uh, old huts, uh, Tibetan and Subetran. And we also involve, uh, oh God, <laughs> okay, involve local artists uh, to prepare some uh, extra sculpture. And um, our edu as an educator, our, my role was uh, to design the final settings, educational settings, and the con decoration um, with, uh, with this to this uh, exhibit. And also, uh, we've got uh, some uh, educational settings for disabled people and uh, decoration uh, as well. And the last one, European Economic Area, uh, we, uh, we built the uh, educational pavilion without animals, only for visitors uh, talking about climate change, and we still educated the, our visitors, uh, and we tried to create new uh, habits, new uh, eco, uh, proper eco uh, behavior. Yeah, there are a lot of there were lots of contests. And uh, my uh, question for you, could you help me to design new gorilla exhibit? <laughs> it's now under uh, design. Uh, we, uh, I'm working with a work our working group uh, with arch architecture, zookeepers, uh, and our management. And uh, I'm looking forward inspiration, good ideas. But not only, if you have some uh, bad ideas, what we should avoid, yes, in, in this project, please contact me. This is my email address. I'm looking forward to any ideas you have. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much. Tiago, where are you? There you are. And you're gonna talk about, about innovative learning environments. Thank you. Um, I have to say something first. Uh, Sarah told me before that someone had asked about the posters, of, and of course you will have them afterwards. Uh, and also the same with the presentations. They are also, of course, available afterwards to all of you. There you go. Good, mor good morning to you all. 
I, I'm not accustomed to talk with microphone. I think it's an innovative thing. Um, <laughs> uh, I'm very pleased to be here. I'm Tiago from Lisbon Zoo. And before we go any further, I want you to know that I consider a zoo um, by itself like an innovative learning environment. But I think that people can create, uh, we are zoo educators, we can create inside the zoo new innovative learning environments and take these environments to outside, uh, outside the zoo. And in the, um, the first idea, I went, idea that I want to pass is when we think about uh, innovative, uh, normally we think about uh, sci-fi things like uh, futuristic things with holograms and all of these. But the word that is behind um, innovative, it's uh, creativity. Uh, when you think about uh, put something new, you have to think outside the box and have to think in new things. Uh, and sometimes you can take the older programs that you have, add something, mix something, and you create something new. And this, this, is, this is very important because when you, mm, and someti sometimes people uh, uh, ask me why, why we should innovate. Uh, because we, we face new challenges uh, um, every day. People, uh, we know that people have multiple intel intelligence ev uh, nowadays. Uh, we know that people came from everywhere to our zoo, from other countries, from other regions of, the, uh, of, of our country. And we know that, that people live inside the cities and people miss the connection with the nature because we are living uh, uh, inside the cities. And sometimes we have misconceptions about the wildlife, like this one. Uh, and we, the, the challenge uh, we have is to, to, to teach the people uh, uh, and to put all the people together to uh, people get more knowledge and to, and to get more uh, uh, immersive uh, learning environments. So I say challenge accepted, let's go. Um, one thing, that, uh, when, when we think about how to face this challenge, it's like um, a recipe. Uh, you have to put all the ingredients. Um, the numbers with the other symbols are uh, the links between standards and uh, all these ingredients. And you have one special ingredient that is unknown. Because uh, to you create some innovative scenarios, there are ingredients that came to you, knock your door. For example, after I listen my family um, a talk in the morning, I can't stop thinking about hyenas, and I, I, will, I will take the hyenas to, uh, to, to, the programs, to the programs in the future. Uh, and I think uh, uh, innovative learning scenarios, and when you think about teaching, you have to think about a form of art. It, teaching is not a delivery system. You cannot take the information and put the information in the people. You have to think like a, a painting uh, or a sculpture or music, okay? Um, and you, need, you will need two things to, to this. You will need a good methodology that is different between, uh, you, you can have uh, several metho met methodology. Uh, uh, we use Bloom taxonomies uh, sometimes, uh, and you can mix all this. We have this pyramid with the bottom, and you can straight, and you go straight, or you can mix all this up. But the point is, you have to uh, um, uh, put your, your people to have the, the, the will to discover. You have to put the methodology outside the zoo, for example, in a, in a silent forest uh, campaign. Uh, you have to do team buildings with your team with, this, with the same methodology, and you have to do evaluation, like uh, this kid with the um, active expression devices of the Promethean. And the other thing, uh, uh, after you have a good methodology, you have to have a good team. Uh, and you have to train your team and to share the, the, your vision with your team so they can think like you. Uh, and uh, when I share the vision with my team, and nowadays team, these guys came to me and say, I have this new idea. I, have, I, I want to put more, more knowledge on this and I can take all the inputs, uh, 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 all the inputs that team g gave to me and I put these inputs inside the programs and create new programs. And now uh, I, I, will, I will show you three different programs. Uh, this one uh, is an example. Uh, of um, how, the, how the team could work, uh, um, how the team ca could work everywhere. It, it, this image came from the 2015 in Lisbon conference, uh, an educator doing some guided visits inside the tram. Uh, and when I, when I put this challenge to my team, they say, oh, it's impossible. And I said to them, uh, a good zoo educator do education everywhere. Because if you are, if you are accustomed to do education in the, in, in the zoo, you can do it everywhere. So I want, now I want to show you three innovative learning environments that uh, zoo participate and the zoo team participate. First, uh, first of, of the, the programs are Kids Dive. Kids Dive. Kids Dive are a program that we do in partnership 
uh, with several uh, uh, um, partners. One of our partners is, is um, a, a Lisbon University, and we teach the kids dive, but it's not all that. It's not all that. We teach the, ki we teach the kids dive, but the kids have uh, lots of workshops about biodiversity, uh, uh, about plastic in the ocean, and it's all experience so the kids can learn more about all of this experience. Other program that is very good is multi-sensory tree of life. Uh, evolution is not bad written, it's evolution for all, okay? Uh, because we, we take blind people to put them in, cont in contact with, uh, uh, with this uh, evolution, with this concept. This was created by these two beautiful ladies, Thelma and Marisa, and we are, in the, we, we are creating some, uh, uh, we, we talk with the keepers, so keepers give some materials to us, so we can show to the, to the, to the people how the evolution works through the multi-sensory uh, experience. And the last one, uh, it's uh, uh, um, uh, a program that involves all the people in the zoo, vets, uh, keepers, uh, the, these actors go to the zoo and learn about the zoo and about the, the story of the female and the male of leopards that been to a breeding center, they go to a breeding center in Russia and take uh, a, a, a theater, a musical about this. I don't want to see the howl, but I will show a little video. <laughs> I like howls, but I <laughs> a little video, for it's 40 seconds, okay, only you to know. Uh, they will sing in Portuguese, but the, uh, what they sing, it's like, uh, this is animals in the zoo, let's conserve. Uh, and all the, all the, the, the music I'll talk about, endangered species programs, uh, EAS, how the zoos function, okay, and go for several cities in Portugal. That's it. Final thought, um, be creative because uh, when I start to work in Lisbon Zoo, um, we are like 10 educators. And nowadays, uh, past 13 years, uh, we create a lot of programs. Uh, and now we have like this team working on, on all these programs, I these ones and another ones. And um, if you want to talk with me, I will in the coffee breaks, more than seven minutes. Uh, and many thank you to, all, to you all. Thank you very much, Tiago. I totally agree with you with your explanation about the educators. So finally, the last presentation will come from Sarah. Hello. Hi, everyone. Um, I'll try and keep this brief because I know we're, everyone's probably waiting for lunch. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about some of the vocational programs we offer at ZSL. Um, my name's Sarah, and I'm uh, one of the practical learning officers. So, oh, I forgot I need to use this thing. There we go. <laughs> um, so ZSL is made up of four parts. So we have our London Zoo, Whipsnade Zoo, conservation programmes and our Institute of Zoology. So these events that we hold um, are a really great way of kind of utilising the skills across those four areas of our zoos. So the events I'm going to focus on are three key events, our Conservation Careers Day, our Animal Training and Welfare Careers Day, and our Zoo Vet Careers Day. So I'll talk a little bit more about these events in just a moment. So they are one-day interactive courses. They're designed for 13 to 18-year-olds. Um, most of the time, they're people that are actually interested in animal-related careers. Um, so the way that the days kind of run, they're started with a um, like a talk like a general careers talk by the experts in the morning then after that they split into four groups um, normally they're grouped by age um, and there's maximum 10, 10 children per group they will then go around a carousel of four different activities led by one of the edu education team and we will all return back to our education department at the end of the day for kind of a summary and a last chance to ask any questions so the sessions that we run, they're quite varied. Um, as I said, there's four different sessions per, um, per event. 
Um, the sessions are run by the keepers, the vets, uh, the conservationists. So to give you some examples of those, we've got um, on our Zoo Vet Careers Day, we have um, a tour of our veterinary facility and we also um, meet with the vets, the vet nurses, and we do kind of a resuscitation session, an ultrasound session with um, a lifelike dog there. Um, and there's another picture there just showing you um, the children there. They get out all of the equipment. It's really quite interactive. On Conservation Careers Day, the guys get a chance to actually use some of the conservation equipment, camera traps, um, they do small mammal trapping, and they get to sort of take all of the measurements of the different animals that they're, they're trapping, supposedly, um, giving them a nice insight to that. Um, we also bring them into one of our classrooms and we hold a session where they do some eel trapping. So our, one, our conservation team works out in the Thames in London and they work with the eels out there. So they, they kind of show them, explain how they actually do all of the trapping and the, the relocations and things. Um, another session is our enrichment sessions. So we have four different animals that day that we can actually make enrichment for and go out and put that enrichment in. We can evaluate the enrichment and talk about the importance of it as well. Um, and then another example is um, we have our welfare officer there and she will talk about um, the importance of enclosure design and y using the correct um, things in a cockroach enclosure there, for example. So the idea of these events is to give um, participants an insight into the work of um, zoo professionals and they can look at the different roles available and what the day-to-day -day involves. They will also gain hands-on experience in their chosen field as well through the interactive sessions, and they will come away more knowledgeable of how to actually obtain those different animal careers. So we work quite collaboratively across the society, as I mentioned earlier. Um, the education team do all of the initial planning phases, sort of um, the timings, the consent forms, and all of the add mini bits, um, and then we work alongside the different teams to actually develop the session content and um, work on the delivery of the content as well. Um, one of the main challenges with that is normally staff time and actually finding a date when all of the vets are available and, and things like that, so that's probably our biggest challenge. Um, but the benefits to the society um, is that we can utilise those skills. Um, it's very much kind of facilitated by education, but we're actually using the experts, and that's the, the, the real people that the kids actually want to meet. Um, we can inspire, engage, and mo motivate them to take those steps into their career, and it's also a really good opportunity for staff development as well. So we evaluate each of the courses that we run. We give out um, a survey monkey link at the end of the session. We then ask the participants to return that survey link and we will then give them their certificate of attendance. Um, so it's a little bit, <laughs> little bit of bribery there, um, but it means that we get quite a lot of evaluation back, which is really helpful. Um, we can then use that to improve future events and we also um, analyze it and put together like a top line data report for that as well. So the way we'd like to go forward with them, um, we'd like to reach out more to local communities, perhaps offer funded places to local schools and colleges. Um, and we'd also like to kind of progress the relationships that we develop with the participants, um, perhaps offering them volunteering opportunities, giving them a chance to kind of create blog posts, and also perhaps invite them back to actually do a talk um, on return, so um, when we hold these events in future, they can actually come and, and talk about their experiences and perhaps where they are now with those. And that's me done. Thank you for listening. Thank you very much, Sarah. Almost done with this session. And I think you look forward for a break now and a lunch. But before that, we have a few more minutes about 15 minutes for questions, don't we? I look at you, Sarah. I don't know why. <laughs> yes, where is the questions? Uh, I would so like who are you going to gonna ask Hi, I'm first? Teresa. You're going to ask who? I'm going to ask uh, Maria. Maria Hello. Matlova. Correct? I don't know where she is. Yeah, 
Can all the speakers come up here? It's easier. Okay. Uh, I was just wondering why didn't you use new technologies to engage this audience as they have they were born with a mobile phone? <laughs> Thank you for your question. Well, it's because I'm not good in these technologies <laughs> yet. Oh, okay. But did you consider that it would be important to use it? Yes, I'm going to try uh, okay. these types of lessons. But firstly, I have to learn more about <laughs> these technologies. <laughs> okay, okay, thank you. <laughs> Hi, uh, my question goes to the same person. Thank you for your presentation, very interesting. I was wondering, um, you know, you said the field trips and the perspective of the kids of how they enjoy didn't really relate to learning. Um, I was wondering whether this was because the teachers or the people who accompany the people didn't really do like a pre-trip session and a past pre-session, pre you know, like most of the times teachers go on those field trips with the kids and it's a day of joy, but it doesn't really, is not well prepared and you know, you know what I mean? Like, did you do any follow-up research and why that was? Well, I'll try to answer if I understand right. Uh, during field trip, they have also do some tests and they know that they will have tests at the end of every field trip. Uh, they have to write down all the objects that we see. And uh, there are the same people who do lessons, who do lectures, and who do trips. So children know that if they don't learn, it's not good. <laughs> uh, it, it, was it your question or not? Just, you know, like the field trips for some of the teachers in schools, the field trips are like project work, you know, is, is, is more of an what we would say innovative way of learning. So maybe the teachers, as you said, you know, technology is not your, your comfort zone. Maybe the field trips were not the comfort zone rather than the lecturing. And that was linked to the educational outcome. I was just wondering if there was a link that you found. Mm, well, I don't know <laughs> actually what to say. Okay, any more, oh, any more questions? Okay, Laura has one. <laughs> uh, this will maybe give you some insight into the ER's office in that we occasionally spend lunch times talking about ERs as a musical. So I'd love to know, was it a success and did it sell out? A lot. So the, they normally, uh, this is a co uh, th theater company that normally do uh, some musicals to schools. And this year rocks everything. They go, they uh, sold out everything, every um, space they, they, they will go. They rock, absolute, uh, absolutely. <laughs> uh, so because is you, you combine, and this is the point of innovative learning environments, you combine two things that are very strong, music and animals. So, <laughs> Okay, that's it. Right. Uh, hi. Whoa, Jesus. <laughs> <coughs> My question is for Anna. Uh, I uh, wondered if you could talk about um, at which point does the education department get involved in the exhibit design and uh, uh, like what is the amount of input that you give into it and uh, how much do how much does it stick? Well, I was involved from the very beginning till the very end <laughs> and uh, I spent a lot of time during 
uh, whole day, for example, a Thursday on uh, wi working with uh, specialists. Um, I focus only uh, about on educational settings and facilities, uh, and uh, that's it. <laughs> Are you happy? <laughs> yeah, she is. Okay. <laughs> no. <laughs> uh, yeah, okay. Um, my question is more like, uh, sure you give the input, like what will be good for education, right? But there are uh, maybe conflicting needs, what you want for education maybe, um, uh, in some people's opinion, not the best for animal welfare. And so what's the balance? Uh, there weren't any conflicts. <laughs> <laughs> but yes, uh, the most important thing was animals, of course. Yes, the, the enclosure for animals, the materials we, uh, we should use. Um, then we focus uh, over visitors. And new technology, for example, in Fokiox, we, uh, we have two uh, across other exhibit, other uh, exam enclosure. And, uh, but as I said, the animals was the first, yes? Then visitors. Thank you. Okay. Okay. No more questions. Thank you very much. Have a seat, please. Now we get some uh, very good examples how we can work in your zoo.